so the Passover. The backstory is a story of Exodus. Uh, you have to know this much that God's people, the Israelites, were the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Uh, through the person of Joseph and that family, wound up going down from the land of Israel down to Egypt, where at first they were there, uh, rescued from a famine, but over the course of time, they became slaves there. Uh, they increased, they multiplied, God caused them to flourish, and the Egyptians became jealous, they became concerned about them, so they enslaved them, they worked them ruthlessly and bitterly, the lives of God's people, the Israelites, became very, very difficult for hundreds of years. And they started crying out, God, if you're there, if anyone's there, help us. And God heard their cries. There was a man named Moses who we're about to be introduced to. His backstory is this. He actually, uh, when he was just an infant, there was an attempt to kill all the Israelite infants. He almost miraculously was saved when his mother put him in his basket and floated him down the Nile River. One of the princesses of Pharaoh ended up picking him out of the river, raised him in the palace. So the first 40 years of his life, he was actually raised as royalty in the Egyptian palace of Pharaoh. At age 40, he began to see what the world was like. He began to identify with his people. He wanted to leave in that palace. He wound up in the desert, uh, far from everyone, working as a shepherd. That was the second 40 years of his life. And then, at age 80, God called him. And this is the story beginning in chapter 3. Now, Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he left the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I'll go over and see the strange sight, why the bush did not burn up. When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, Here I am. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals. For the place where you're standing is holy ground. Then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face, because he was afraid to look at God. And God said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians, to bring them up out of that land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, the home of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Levites, and Jebusites. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me. I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now go. I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. What a call to get at age 80. Uh, he'd been, you know, first in the palace, then out in the wilderness, and God's called him, hey, you're going to be the leader. You're going to be my mouthpiece. You're going to go to Pharaoh and say, let my people go. You're going to lead these people out of this land. Moses had a couple questions. So, in verse 11, Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? There it is. Who am I? Who am I? Why me? What, what's my life all about? What do you, why me? Who am I? That's the question. God answers in verse 12, says, I will be with you. This will be the sign to you that is I who I have sent you, that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. Moses then has a second question. Moses said to God, Suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask me, What is his name? Then what shall I tell them? Okay, this question I think actually reveals some things that we're just pointing out. First of all, I think it's a pretty good question, right? Now, Moses is going to show up. He's going to say to Pharaoh, let my people go. He's going to say, okay, my people, let's go. God wants you. And they're going to be like, what God? Who? 
you know, what's his name? And Moses wants an answer. Uh, that actually says something about the Israelites. They had been slaves in Egypt for now something like 400 years. They no longer remembered who their God was. Of course, they were the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Joseph, who, you know, God had been with them and called them and they knew him, but after some period of time, as they lived in Egypt, as time went by, probably it was slowly but surely, the memory of this God began to fade, and more likely than not, the gods of the Egyptians became their gods, and they took on the worldview and faith life of all the people that surrounded them, and more likely than not, had exactly the same faith as all of their captors, right? They no longer remembered the name of their God. Anyway, the answer, so important. Verse 14, God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you're to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, say to the Israelites, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, has sent me to you. This is my name forever. The name you shall call me from generation to generation. In verse 15, you see this, these two words, the Lord, and Lord is in all capital letters. Do you see that? Capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. Do you see that in the Bible? I just want you to know this, and you can almost turn to any page in the Old Testament, and you're going to see the word Lord, and you're going to see it in all capitals. Every time you see it, the name behind that is the Hebrew word Yahweh, which simply means I am. Moses said, listen, uh, they asked what your name is, what do I tell them? And God answered, he said, I am Yahweh. That's the word. And every time you see a capital L-O-R-D, all in caps, that's the Hebrew word that's there, the I am. We can spend some time talking about what this means, how God is self-existent, how he has no beginning or end, how everything else that has its existence has its existence due to the I am who stands behind it all and he's the creator of everything, set apart. We could spend a lot of time talking about that. I won't now. But this is so profound. God says, you tell him the I am, the one true God most certainly is, exists now and always. The Alpha, the Omega, whatever, whatever we finally say about it, we got into it. That's the God who has sent me to you. Anyway, as time goes on, Moses winds up having another question, right? So the first question, who am I? The second question, who are, who are you, God? And in fact, he has another question like, how will anyone believe this? So I want you to turn to chapter 4. Just kind of scan your eyes down or turn the page if you have to. Chapter 4, Moses answered, What if they do not believe me or listen to me and say, The Lord, see there it is again in all caps, The Lord did not appear to you. So, see what the central question is? It's faith. You know, listen, God, let it show up and say, God sent me to you. You know, what if they don't believe? I think this is probably the central question of this entire few chapters we're going to be looking at. It's all about faith. How, how do we know that there's a God? I mean, we look at this world around us. He's not evident to our eyes or to our senses. How, how do we know? Or then if we do finally, you know, through our experience in this life, the awe and wonder, we see at various different things, or just even in the quietness of our own heart, sense, yes, there is a creator God. How do we know that he's the God who revealed himself here in the Bible or to Moses in this moment? And how can we trust him or know that he has good things in store? How, how can we know? Or how can we believe? Or how can we have faith? That's the question. Verse 2. God's answer, I think, really interesting. Then the Lord said to him, what's that in your hand? A staff, he replied. The Lord said, throw it on the ground. So Moses threw it on the ground and it became a snake, and he ran from it. 
Then the Lord said to him, Reach out your hand and take it by the tail. So Moses reached out and took hold of the snake and turned it back into a staff in his hand. This, said the Lord, is so that they may believe that the Lord, the God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, has appeared to you. I've got to pause here. I guess it's kind of weird, right? Um, Moses asks asks this tremendous question like, hey, how how do we know? And uh, God answers this question. He's like, what's that in your hand? So I just grab this backstage. This is my uh, this is my staff. And Moses, of course, was a shepherd. And of course, shepherds, uh, as they walk around, only have a stick in their hand for walking. But they use the shepherd's staff for a whole number of things, right? If a sheep needs to be prodded or pulled back, or, you know, poked forward. This the shepherd's got this in his hand, and this is what he uses. It's a sign of his authority over the sheep, or the way in which he rules them, or guides them, or leads them. Anyway, I was like, what's that in your hand? It's like my, it's my staff. God says, okay, take that, you know, and what is what is the staff? It's a piece of dead wood. It's a stick, right? That's what it was. Take that dead wood staff and throw it on the ground, which Moses did. And the moment that he took that piece of dead wood and threw it on the ground, that dead wood came alive and became a snake. And I guess it was, you know, slithering around. And God said to Moses, okay, now pick it up. And he grabbed it by the tail and picked it up, and as it did, you know, back to a stab, a dead stick of wood. And, okay, listen, I guess on one level, hey, if I could do that this morning, probably all the questions that we all have about faith, I mean, they get cleared up, right? So if I just took this and, you know, snake, and you guys at the front got up on your seats, uh, it'd be over, right? Like, uh, worship would break out in a new way. I know that. Right? And, and then I'd pick it back up. So on the one hand, okay, how do I know? Well, dead sticks don't turn into living snakes. <laughs> Ever. How do I know? But there's more going on here. And as we go through the next chapters, I want to show you what that is. Let's start here. I want you to just, maybe some of us have to get back to like junior high or high school. Uh, I want you to think about in the history books, every picture you ever saw of Pharaoh. Okay, so I don't know if you can think about that. I, I uh, hear a help, I went on the internet, I just pulled down some pictures. What do you see? In almost every single picture of Pharaoh, what do you see now? Always. Pharaoh's always holding a staff in his hand. And, you know, I guess that was culture at the time. None of our leaders walk around carrying staffs anymore. What was that staff? What did it symbolize? Well, it symbolized Pharaoh's authority and power. Like a shepherd who who directs the sheep, you know, prodding or pulling, uh, who guides their lives, who leads them to food and water. The prevailing thought was that Pharaoh was almost like a god to the people. He was the one who, when he spoke or when he exercised, he, he exercised his authority. He was the one who provided food. He was the one who provided shelter. He was the one in charge. And He always, I mean, you see this every single picture you ever see in the Egyptian Pharaoh, he always had in his hand a staff. And what we're going to see is that actually Moses' staff and Pharaoh's staff are going to have something like a, well, we'll just call it like a showdown. Uh, Page forward to Exodus chapter 7. We're going to start in verse 8. I mean, this is such fascinating stuff. Uh, there is, you know, I think most of you will know this. In the process of God leading his people out of Egypt, there were a series of ten plagues that God carried out on Egypt. 
signs and wonders and even horrors upon that land. Pharaoh kept hard in his heart, but eventually, at the tenth flag, wound up finally letting the people go. Well, anyway, just before the plagues start, there's this passage, beginning in verse 8. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron, Aaron, when Pharaoh says to you, perform a miracle, then say to Aaron, take your staff, there it is again, the staff, and throw it down before Pharaoh, and it will become a snake. So Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and did just as the Lord commanded. Aaron threw down his staff in front of Pharaoh and his officials, and it became a snake. Pharaoh then summoned wise men and sorcerers, and the Egyptian magicians also did the same things by their secret arts. Each one threw down a staff, and it became a snake. But Aaron's staff swallowed up their staffs. Yet Pharaoh's heart became hard, and he would not listen to them, just as the Lord had said. So, here we get the first sense of the showdown. You know, Moses is going to walk into the court of Pharaoh and say, you know, let my people go. You know, I am the Lord commands it. And he's going to say something like, well, you know, if your God commands it, then what's the sign, what's the miracle to show that, in fact, the God of the universe is commanding me, Pharaoh, to let these people go? God says, don't worry about it. When he does it, just take the staff and again, throw it down and it'll become a snake. Uh, no, but again, if you're Pharaoh and that happens, uh, you know, I guess all your questions are supposed to be over, right? You know, God says, let the people go, how do I know, he says. Well, look at this. Anyway, Pharaoh saw it, and he must have had the reaction that any of us would have. I mean, this amazing thing, or a dead stick becomes a living snake. So he summons his magicians and those who practice secret arts or whatever, and apparently they take a staff, and they throw it down, and the same thing happens. Except that Moses' staff, Aaron's staff, goes and eats Pharaoh's staff. And uh, it's interesting here, it doesn't say that the snake ate the snake. It says that his staff ate the staff. And I would just say that, okay, this is like the prelude to what's going on here. There is a showdown between the authority of Moses God, the great I Am, and Pharaoh. And as the flags move forward, you can see the showdown, uh, I mean, it, it follows these lines. And so let's just kind of work our way through. We'll start with the very first flag. It's called the Plague of Blood. In verse 14 uh, is where it starts. Uh, God has some instructions to Moses. He's to go to Pharaoh, and he's supposed to stand by the Nile River and hold the staff up. And when he holds the staff up, the Nile River is going to turn to blood. And so we'll pick it up in verse 20. So as Moses and Aaron did just as the Lord had commanded. He raised his staff. You see the, the, how the staff was right at the center. He raised his staff in the presence of Pharaoh and his officials and struck the water of the Nile. And all the water was changed into blood. The fish of the Nile died. And the river smelled so bad that the Egyptians could not drink its water. Blood was everywhere in Egypt. So that's the first plague. The Nile River, which, the Nile River, by the way, was the fresh water source in Egypt that made uh, Egypt the breadbasket that it was. Because they had this fresh water source, they always had food. Whenever there was a famine anywhere, they always went down to Egypt because they always had this source of fresh water with which they could grow crops. And so the Nile River was very important to who they were as a people. And Moses stands beside the Nile, he holds up the staff, he strikes the water, it all turns to blood. And, I mean, the description here, it was obviously gross. It was death, it was smelly, the fish died. It was a plague. Anyway, verse 22, it says the Egyptian magicians did the same things by their secret arts. And Pharaoh's heart became hard, he would not listen to Moses and Aaron, just as the Lord had said. All right, now, this is the first crack we see, because, you know, again, you hold the staff, you throw it down in front of the snake, question's over. I mean, I believe, you don't have to tell me again, 
But Pharaoh's like, wait a second, that could be a sleight of hand, that could be some kind of trick. Yeah, I've got magicians too. And they come and apparently they can do the same thing. Here though, um, and we're going to see it build as we go from one play to the next. Here though, you see the first crack. Uh, there's something funny going on. Uh, Moses had taken a staff, it touched the Nile, it all turned to blood. And the Pharaoh brings out his magician. It just simply says they were able by their secret arts to do the same thing. Just now wrap my mind around it. Have you missed my drawings? <laughs> all right. Not a river. Here we go. All right. Moses comes along. <laughs> right there I go. That was something. He, he touches the water and it turns to blood. Right? So the Nile River is blood. And Pharaoh's like, wait a second. I have magicians that can do the same thing. So he calls his magicians and they come out. My youngest daughter really liked the hats I gave him. <laughs> and they bring their staffs and apparently they're able to, wait a second. If it's already blood, what did they do? I mean, you just have to sit back and think about it. You're like, you know, they take their staff and they're like, blood, see, we did it too. <laughs> just spend a little time thinking about that one. Uh, it's not as obvious yet, but it becomes more and more obvious. This is some kind of showdown. Uh, so the second plague is the plague of frogs. It starts in chapter 8. Uh, same kind of thing if you look at verse 6 and 7. So, so Aaron stretched out his hand over the waters of Egypt, and the frogs came up and covered the land. So I don't know how to picture this, but, you know, God had said to Moses, hey, stretch out your staff, and hordes of frogs would come on the land. He stretched out his staff, and up from the waters, all just, I don't know, how do you even describe it? Like a horde of frogs. I couldn't even think about how to draw it, but you can picture it in your own mind, right? Just, I guess we sometimes have this happen in Florida. I mean, I remember this a couple of times where, I guess the thing about frogs, they're incredibly reproductive, and so once they get going, like next thing you know, they're just everywhere. And that's what happened. Okay, now look at verse 8. But the magicians did the same things by their secret arts. They also made frogs come up on the land of Egypt. So wait a second. This is pretty weird, right? Like Moses said, frogs come forth, and all of a sudden frogs are coming forth, and the magicians are like, oh yeah, we can do the same thing. Frogs, come forth. Well, I mean, when Moses does it, that's something. When the magicians do it, what is it? I mean, I, I'm not... I don't know. Uh, I think we're starting to see that there's something false or fake in Egypt. It becomes really plain, and they give up in the third plague, which is called the plague of Nazareth. I think some of your translations would call it the plague of lice. Some creepy, crawly, we don't exactly know how to translate it, but it was gross. It was the plague, and you'll get the picture. We'll start in verse 16. The Lord said to Moses, Tell Aaron, stretch out your staff and strike the dust of the ground. And throughout the land of Egypt, the dust will become gnats or lice or some creepy crawly thing. They did this, and when Aaron stretched out his hand with the staff and struck the dust of the ground, gnats came on people and animals. All the dust throughout the land of Egypt became gnats. Ugh. Like some of us are just like, you know, I see, I see some of you starting to itch, right? It's like you almost have to when you think about all of these gnats or lice or whatever on every person. So Pharaoh again calls his magicians, can you do that? Look at verse 18. But when the magicians tried to produce gnats by their secret arts, they could not. So, okay. Nile River turns blood. The magicians come along, turn blood, Nile River, and it's blood. Uh, Moses said, come forth, horde of frogs, and frogs are coming forth, and the magicians come along, and they're like, come forth, horde of frogs, and there's, I don't know, my aunt, my aunt, still frogs. 
But when they have dust, and they say, dead dust, come alive, and I don't know, like, you know, gnats, uh, living creatures come out of that dust, the magicians come along, and they're like, you know, uh, can't, can't do it. Can't do it. And I hope you see now, the staff, it's always at the center. It's a question about God's authority, his rule, or Pharaoh's authority, and the Egyptian rule. And what's happening here, actually, is that all the gods, all the story, all the worldview of Egypt is being unmasked. It's being exposed. I don't want to get too far into this, but just a few minutes. Uh, if you go back to, I don't know, again, you've probably got to be in junior high and high school, and if you don't remember ever studying this, you know, a couple hours on Wikipedia will just be a lot of fun. But there was a variety of Egyptian gods. So Moses, when he asked God his name, he says, I am the I am. I am the one true God. There is no one. But the Egyptians, of course, they had a story of the world. And just about every powerful thing, there was a god behind it. So here, I'll show you some pictures of their pantheon. One of their gods' names was Hapi. Hapi was the god of the Nile. Of course, the Nile was very important in Egyptian culture because it was all the fresh water. And Hapi was the one who, as an example, made the Nile flood every year, provided all the fresh water in the land, and they worshipped the Nile, Hapi, as a god. There is another god. His name was Hecate. Uh, you can see a picture of him. You can see there he has the frog face. He was the Egyptian god of fertility. Uh, why the frog face? Because, as I said, the frogs are terribly reproductive, so I guess it made sense to them that uh, when fertility was needed, frogs were the perfect symbol of it. And what was it that made things abound or be abundant? That uh, was the god of fertility, Hecate. Or they had another god. His name was Geb. He was the god of the ground, or the god of dust. And uh, anyway, his name was Geb. You just go back. What, do you see this? Every single plague was focused at unmasking one of their gods. So the first plague, which struck the Nile, turned the fresh water into blood, was a way of saying, Happy, you are not the one who provides fresh water. You are nothing, and he's exposed. The second one, Hecate, this god of fertility. You are not the one, Hecate, that brings fertility, that brings abundance. The I am is the one. Geb, the god of dust or ground. You are not the one. You are nothing. Only the great I am, right? There's a showdown between the true god of the universe and the gods of the Egyptians. A couple other gods. They had a god named Hathor, who was a god of cattle. You can see a picture of art in various different ways. The fifth plague was a plague that killed off the, the cattle. There was another Egyptian god, the god Set, who was in charge of the weather. And uh, the seventh plague was actually a plague which was a great hailstorm. Set, you're not in control. You have no authority. You don't control the weather. It's just the one true god, the great I am. He's in control of everything, so whether it's water, whether it's food, whether it's the weather, whether it's cattle, whether, no matter what it is, one by one, each one of these plagues was not just a terrible thing that happened. It was a direct statement that all the gods of the Egyptians are false. None of them are true. They all stand exposed. They control nothing. They have no power or authority over you. You get that? No power or authority. The ninth plague. I don't know if you remember this. Anyone remember what the ninth plague was right before the Passover? It was a plague of bugs. The chief deity of the Egyptian pantheon was a god named Amun Ra, the sun god. And, you know, sort of the, the chief god goes last. Amun Ra, you don't control the sun. The one true God exercises authority even over sunlight. You see this? Each one of the plagues was directly connected 
to each of the Egyptian gods. And of course, not only were the Egyptians watching on, but the Israelites were watching on. They were seeing that, wait a second, this one true God does control everything, and the Egyptian story and their pantheon, they're nothing. Anyway, I want you to turn with me now to chapter 12. We'll get to the Passover. The Passover was the 10th plague. And uh, here, you'll have to open it in front of me. I'm just going to summarize what happened, and we'll spend some more time on it next week. God said to the people, all right, Israelites, from now on, this month that we're in right now, he said, this is going to be the first month of your year. Look on the month of Nisan, and on the 10th day of this month, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go out and I want you to get a ram, a lamb, one year old. And I want you to bring it to your house, tie it up by the post outside, and just keep it there. Of course, if everyone did that, you know, all the Egyptians would be looking on and say, what are they doing? Then on the 14th day at twilight, chapter 12 says, slaughter it. And, of course, you may eat a meal, but before you do, you take the blood of that ram, and you dip it in a hyssop plant, and I want you to paint the doorposts of your house. Because tonight, on the 14th night, you know, early in the morning on the 15th, the angel of death is going to, and this is where Passover is thing, is going to pass over. And every house that does not have that blood painted on the doorpost, in that house there will be death. And so, every Israelite, this is what you've got to do. You've got to go out and you've got to get a ram. You've got to put it to death. That death will stand as a substitute to your death. And paint the doorpost as a sign so when the angel sees the blood, he'll pass over. Now, uh, I want to take you to Luxor in Egypt, where the temple of Amun Ra stood, the chief deity. This is an artist's rendering. Uh, there was a big street leading up to the temple. What do you see beside the street? That's an artist's rendering. Or maybe this will even be better. This is a picture. You can go there today. Much of it still stands. What kind of animal was that? It was a ram. Which, by the way, in Egypt was a sacred animal. And it was the animal that symbolized Amun Ra. So, Israelites, here what you need to do. You take the sacred animal of the Egyptians, you put it on the doorpost of your house for four days, and slaughter it, and put that blood on your doorposts. And God's going to show up. And he's going to arrest you and release you. Do you believe it? Here, I'll just show you this from Exodus chapter 8, so you can see what a crisis of faith this would have been. Uh, Pharaoh, in one of the flags, already had said to Moses and Aaron, Hey, why don't you just stay here and make your sacrifice? Why don't you got to leave to make your sacrifice? And look at Moses' response. He says, That would not be right. The sacrifices we offer the Lord our God would be detestable to the Egyptians. And if we offer sacrifices that are detestable in our eyes, will they not stone us? So I want you to think about the moment. This was the moment, okay, you've seen that the I Am is in control of fresh water. You've seen that the I Am is in control of fertility. You've seen that the I am is in control of the ground and cattle and the weather and locusts. And the I am, these Egyptian gods are nothing. They're nothing. Do you believe that? Because listen, if God doesn't show up, tomorrow morning the Egyptians are going to kill you. This is this this faith. It's not just some incident, it's a matter of life and death, and you have to decide. Do you believe in the one true God, or do you buy into the story of the culture around you? Now, here, we better just take a moment for application. I am pretty sure that none of us who are here today are even remotely tempted to start worshiping the gods of the Egyptians, right? 
Like when I described how big people were like, hmm, that's interesting. No, none of us were. None of us thought to ourselves, let me bow down and worship Epic or Deb or Set or, I mean, none of us are about ready to go start an on the rock hole. Why not? Because, well, it's ridiculous. I mean, we know better, right? That story is, I mean, it's silly. That's silly. Those aren't gods. That's not real. You don't have to be afraid of that. But, I'll say this, every culture has a story. Ours has one too. I mean, our story's culture is this, that human beings, where we come from, through this long process of chance, it was just random, uh, there's been a material process. There's, you don't have a soul, you're just all material. And there's been this long process where material has just evolved itself and bam, here we are millions and millions, billions and billions of years. And because that's who we are, uh, we don't have a soul, life is just about pleasure. And so, you know, the first one TV tells us and you only go around once. You know, hashtag YOLO, right? You only live once. And so the one who dies with most toys wins. And the way to really just, I mean, what's going to make you happy is just a lot of great experiences and making sure that you get enough money and having the right people around you. And, okay, our culture has a story too. And ultimately, faith is like a crisis that makes us decide. Am I going to buy into the story of my culture? Or am I going to listen to the one true God who revealed himself. Now, this will be a preview for next week, but I think it's important for me to just say this story in the Old Testament is an advanced presentation of the story of Jesus Christ. In fact, John the Baptist, who was the forerunner to Jesus, when he first saw Jesus, he said, look, there's the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The Bible repeatedly calls Christ the Passover lamb. And, listen, you have to decide whether what this Bible says is true, that there's one true God, the great I am, that we are enslaved to sin, that we need to be delivered, we need to be rescued, and the way God has come and done that is through this one true lamb, Jesus Christ, and only if we're covered in his blood will we live and Jesus himself said this, anyone who would come after me must deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. If anyone wants to save his life, he'll lose it. It's only those who will lose their life for my sake that they'll find it. And I'll just tell you this, when you get to these major questions, who am I? Who is God? And how can I do it? It's not incidental. It's not one of those little things. It's just as much life and death. The Bible says only those who are covered by the blood of Jesus, who turn to Jesus and seek deliverance and forgiveness, only those will finally be set free. And so as I finish, I just want to press down. If you're here today and you've been putting off that question, do I believe? I don't it's not incidental, it's not something you put off, you have to decide. Do you believe that there's one true God? Do you believe that you are a slave to sin and you need to be rescued? Do you believe that Jesus Christ is the one true Lamb and His blood alone can save you from your sin? And, and you must decide if life or death. If you're here today and you're considering that question, is there any reason why today you won't finally make that decision to surrender your life and give your life to Jesus. And if you're already a believer, but you've been wavering and you've been wondering, is there any reason why today you won't recommit yourself and, and totally surrender and begin to live your life, the new, redeemed, set free life that God has for you? And uh, in our conclusion of our service, I always provide an opportunity for people to come forward and pray. And today, if you hear God calling in faith, I just want to extend that invitation to you. At the conclusion of the service, please come forward, pray with either myself or one of our prayer team members. If either you're coming to faith for the first time or recommitting your life to Christ, if you see that there's one true God, 
and one of them you'd like to him. I, I just invite you to, to come forward and, and pray with us after the service. Let's pray together now, and then we're going to conclude our service in song.